All right, I think let's get started. Uh, are we live now? Yes, we are live now. Super. All right. Cool. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everyone, to IntelliCloud Solutions and Forsak Academy. So I'm your host for the day, Manika Goyal. And uh, I come here today with Paul Patterson. Uh, he is CEO and founder of Groundwork Apps. A Salesforce ISV partner and he has been a nine time Salesforce MVP and he is a Hall of Fame member as well and uh, he has authored two books on Salesforce programming so uh, we'll be taking some cues from him like uh, how you can kind of skill up yourself in uh, the, as, a, as a developer what are the tips and tricks that you can kind of follow to learn more about Apex, more about LWC and things like that. So that is what we'll be talking about today. And <clears throat> welcome all uh, once again to the live session with uh, Paul. So guys, this is the first LinkedIn, LinkedIn live that we are doing. So we are very excited today. So I hope you enjoy the session with us. Um, Paul, um, over to you, if you can just give a brief introduction about yourself, that will be great, and then we can get started. Yep. Uh, thank you, Manika. I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, yep, as you say, I'm uh, Paul. I'm the CEO and founder of Groundwork Apps. We're a Salesforce ISV partner. I've been working in the Salesforce ecosystem for about uh, 14 or so years now, I think, something like that. Okay. Um, too long. Um, and yeah, I've written a couple of books on Salesforce. Um you know, spoken at a number of events, so people may have seen me around. And I'm really pleased to just be here today to chat chat about coding in Salesforce, really. Sure. Thanks a lot, Paul. So, Paul, I think uh, while we were talking uh, initially, right, so I found very interesting background that you come from. So I would like you to share some insights about that, like what inspired you to delve into the world of coding? How did you, how was your childhood journey? How were, uh, there were, I think, some interesting teenager stories that you can kind of talk about uh, to inspire our listeners. Yeah, sure. So, um, I got into programming because um, I liked playing video games um, and yeah, I'm old enough that uh, when I was playing most of my games they were still 2D um, so it didn't require too much cleverness to do. Um, there was one game I was really obsessed with which is called, <coughs> the modern version is called Football Manager, it's called Championship Manager and then it is um, a, a game where you take over a football or a soccer club and you manage it and it's really just a spreadsheet simulator. Like it's, you have reams and pages of pages of every player having statistics. You know, so they have 10 out of 20 or whatever on different stats and you have to win tournaments and games. And um, I really loved playing that game. Um, I spent far too long in my childhood playing it um, and wanted to learn how to build games, wanted to learn how to do, <coughs> do stuff like that. So started off, um, you know, trying to write a few games and, um, with a language at the time that was called Blitz Basic, so one of the, you know, uh, and Dark Basic, so a couple of the basic variants. Um, and then from there, moved on to um, learning a bit of C++, um, and then took a weird turn into web development because it was just around the, you know, uh, it was just around the time that the internet was becoming a thing. Um, so I remember getting my first computer that had an internet connection. Um, and the first website I ever saw was the NASA website, strangely enough, because it was one of the few places that had a website back then. Um, right. And so, yeah, I loaded up, uh, I remember the, the friend of my dad's who helped us get the computer set up, you know, sort of showed us and opened up NASA and it was like, oh, look at this really high definition picture of a, of a from space. And it would probably be about, you know, you know 500 pixel image nowadays. It'd be something that'd be a thumbnail. Um, mm -hmm. But back then it was incredible. And so, yeah, so I just started programming a bit more web stuff to build some websites, <coughs> um, uh, you know, learned a bit more about HTML and then started working with, um, back then when you were doing a lot of server-side work, you were you either went down PHP, which I did a bit of, or you did something called the Common Gateway Interface of CGI. Um, and so worked with a language called Perl, which is a yeah. very and strange language for those that are on <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, everything's a string. There's no numbers. Which was famous then, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it was 
it was crazy. Like I couldn't okay. couldn't go anywhere near it now, thankfully. Um, yeah, so it was just doing those sorts of things and playing around with stuff. Um, started a couple of little businesses as a teenager, you know, sort of making websites for people, selling web hosting when it was getting started. Um, did a bit on Flash um, and Adobe kind of pieces. And and that was it kind of, you know, was doing all that and um, then decided to stop doing it and went away to university and uh, was working, was uh, my at university, I did a maths degree. So I kind of enjoyed doing the programming side of things, but it was always, always really just like a hobby. And, you know, all of the technology stuff was really kind of a hobby for me. Um, uh-huh. I wanted to, I was really into maths and wanted to, I wanted to go and work in banking where there was a lot of money, basically. You know. um, in the UK, you know, so the area of the UK I'm from at the time, uh, there was people in London earning, and there probably still are, but at the time in particular, people in London earning half a million pound, a million pound a year bonuses. So I was wanting some of that. So I went to and studied maths at uni, uh, university. And uh, when I graduated, there was a big financial crash at the time. Um, and yeah. so uh, there was no banking jobs. And so I just fell back into programming. I'd been doing some programming for a charity um, whilst at university, managing their website, <coughs> rebuilding that and programming that for them. And then um, one of the people there, their husband was an IT manager for a .NET development team and said, mm-hmm. would you do you fancy a, a job uh, as a sort of you know, junior developer? And I said, yep, because I had no other options. And uh, that's where it kind of all started. And from there, after a while, started doing Salesforce because we were, it was, um, we were looking at moving to cloud computing. I played with Salesforce briefly, um, applied for a job at a company that was called Coda uh, mm-hmm. to work, work on a Java or .NET development job. And then I went to the interview and it was actually a company that was about to be called Financial Force and uh, it was all on Salesforce. So uh, yeah, I was I was officially Financial Force's first employee. It was, um, yeah, they, everyone else. So they, they actually spun out from a company called Coda um, so Financial Force, if for anyone who's ever seen Financial Force installed in an org, the um, prefix on the package is C2G, um, uh-huh. and that stands for Coda to Go, which was the original name of the Financial Force application. Um, okay. So I, there was a bunch of people that had moved across from the old company there. But I was the first person to get a Financial Force contract brand new. So, uh, a small claim to fame. There you go. No, no. I think the steps that you have taken, it's incredible. I mean, because the interest, journey is very interesting. I mean, being a gamer, being a, having a flair for the video games, right? And then you started off with the coding and landed on Salesforce. That, that's amazing. I think uh, we can, or our people who are out there kind of still thinking to get into coding or get into development, right? So they can, they, they should take an inspiration basically that, how you can, uh, there, there's no bar around the previous uh, bars on the technologies and stuff like that, where you can kind of, any day is a good day to get started with uh, a new technology, right? Yeah, it's, I don't think you need to have, um, I think when when I first, I'll be very honest, when I first started as a mm-hmm. programmer sort of 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. I think there was a bit more of a requirement for you to have like, a, a CS, you know, computer science background or a, a bit more of a, you know, traditional background. But I think particularly now, you know, it's so easy to just pick up and learn a language, you know, to look around. And there's a plethora of languages and platforms and way of learning them out there. Um, and there's also varying grades of things. So, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to today decide you want to become an embedded C or a Rust programmer or so, you know, something really deep and sort of like, you know, hardcore. Um, you, you don't have to go away and start programming the Linux kernel tomorrow. What you have to do is start off by saying, okay, where do I want to go? And it could be that you go away and start programming by learning how to do formula fields and flows because they're the same conceptually. It's just a logical extension of doing it. Or okay. uh, you know, I, I did a lot of work in Excel and uh, access databases and VBA to start off with. That was one of my first sort of programming jobs before university was I rebuilt a credit card processing system in, in access. Um, it's you know, it's programming still okay. It's not not as super sexy and exciting as you know as building. A, you know, pro- I've got a friend who programs on fighter jets. Um, now that's cool, but equally like she yeah, you know, it sounds really cool. But then she tells me about the tools and things she gets to use and like the review process. I'm just like, oh, that sounds horrific. So you know, everything has its trade off. 
So Salesforce is, I think, comparatively easier than those old traditional languages, right? And you, you get a lot of things to do on the fly uh, at your disposal with minimal set of uh, minimal set of configurations and codings. Basically, that, that that's what you can do, right? Yeah. So uh, tell us a bit more about your journey from a Salesforce developer to a Salesforce MVP and uh, how, how, I mean, how did you kind of stay consistent at uh, and then make it to the Hall of Fame there? So the <coughs> that, that journey is kind of an interesting because I started off, I was very lucky that um, the team I was working with at Financial Force, you know, were, were really pushing all the boundaries. Um, uh -huh. You know, I got to play, <coughs> I remember once, um, so there's a, there's a tool in Salesforce called Custom Settings that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Um, I was on kind of one of the early programs for that and at Financial Force and we were messing around with it. And I remember getting a phone call one day from the product manager and him just being like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm testing out the feature. And he's like, yes, but you've put like a gigabyte and a half of data in it. And we weren't expecting that. You've like crashed a server. Um, and it was just, you know, there was a lot of like really cutting edge stuff. And I remember sort of um, chatting to a few people at the time. And, you know, one of the exciting things then about Salesforce was that um, it wasn't hard to find the, you know, the edge, you know, the cutting edge of stuff because everywhere was the edge. It was all brand new. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and the, the people I were working with were the likes of, you know, so An Andrew Fawcett, who has written, um, you know, a lot on Apex Enterprise stuff and is in fact a product manager at Salesforce now for kind of the developer team. Um, you know, he was my first boss. Um, when I was at Financial, so I learned a lot from him. Uh, a chap called Stephen Wilcock, who's still there and is one of their chief architects. Um, you know, uh, a lady called Carolina Ruiz Medina, who was yeah. one of the first female uh, MVP. Oh, yeah. sorry, first female developer MVP. Um, she, you know, really close friend of mine, but she and I were sat next to each other. So I got, I was really lucky. There was a bunch of very, very clever people when I started out who were doing very, very hard things. And I was able to read their work, work with them, and kind of was like, okay, I want to try this out. And so um, when I moved on from that into consulting roles and through other jobs, I just started kind of <coughs> sharing what I'd learned. So that would sometimes be talking at an event, that would sometimes be in a blog post. Um, you know, I've got a YouTube channel, which I'm you know, relaunching at the moment. Um, and it was just really trying to share all of the weird and wonderful things that I've been thinking about doing, but weren't able to do in my day job. Cause you know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, I did a, I did a talk in 2014 at Dreamforce. Um, mm -hmm. Myself and a coworker built um, uh, a machine learning algorithm in Apex on Salesforce. And this is sort of seven years before Einstein was a thing. You know, we were writing algorithms to do machine learning on Salesforce. And it was a purely kind of, interesting exercise for us to do there was no practical application at all really but we were doing it because it was fun and interesting and people seemed to like that and so I was very very lucky that through through really just being curious and sharing what I was looking at working on what I found interesting and engaging with people on it that I got some good feedback people seemed to like it and um, I was very lucky about nine and a half ten years ago to be nominated to be an MVP and then Every year, I mean, it's it's kind of a little bit of a self fulfilling prophecy as well. That you know, once you're an MVP, people kind of get to know you a bit more, and so you get invited to do yeah. more things. And when you get invited yeah. to do more things, more people know you, and you know, so on and so forth. It's so, a circle. yeah, yeah. So it, it kind of helps on that front. But um, <clears throat> you know, I originally a lot of it was just me wanting to do. I, I spoke to Josh Burke um, on the Salesforce Developer Podcast uh, a couple of years back, and yeah, I've known Josh for a while, and. And, you know, kind of the, the thing that he and I came up with was just that I was known as the guy that did weird stuff in Apex. And that was it, because it was just, what's a stupid thing to do? I mean, let's try that. You know, I built a virtual reality system at some point, like for one Dreamforce. It you know, doesn't need to have a practical use. It just needs to be interesting. Tickle your brain. You know, that's it. So I think weird solutions lead to innovations primarily. So uh... It's, it's 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 amazing actually, and it's really interesting to hear that. I'm I'm enjoying it. So I mean, uh, it just I think it's more kind of like a well for me in particular, it's a thing that yeah you know, 
there's many, many times as a, as a developer, you will sit down and spend eight hours staring at a screen where all you're doing is making a form. And it is a very unexciting thing sometimes. And so you need to do something where you like it, where it's just like, okay, what am I going to do here? And what am I going to learn about it? And so you know, the virtual reality one was when the streaming API came out. And so we had a little Google Cardboard headset. And so we were passing it around the room and people would stand there and people could fire a firework from their phone. And it was just sending a message into Salesforce and a streaming event out, and it was creating fireworks using a Visual Force page. You know, no, no practical so application whatsoever. You know, no one should ever use that code for anything. Like, <laughs> no one should even look at that code as a reference to think about how they should do something. It's just a bit of fun just to say, yeah, look, you can do it. Right. It's, it's a virtual reality, right? So that's Ooh. fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Right, that's fine. So uh, tell me something about like how uh, the developers who are actually starting afresh in their journeys right now, or yeah. probably people who are there. So how can they kind of pave their way towards uh, towards being best coders, being best developers, or probably paving their journey towards Salesforce? So I think I um, want to share that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> there's a couple of things. I think Salesforce is, um, excuse me, as a developer, mm -hmm. learning Salesforce is different from learning other platforms because the best Salesforce developers write the least code. Mm -hmm. um, the best developers in general for any language write the least code, but particularly on Salesforce because you've got so many things that you can use. Um, you know, and doing those sorts of things cleverly. Yeah, I've got a... Um, there's a, a, a customer I was working with a while ago who they built this really custom system to retrieve list view data and populate it elsewhere. And, you know, they were doing all these queries using the rest of uh, the method API to retrieve just so they could you know, filter based upon some extra criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, I sat down with them and I said, well, Joe, we could do this using a formula field. And it was just a formula field. Like it was dead easy, dead quick. And it, I think we deleted like, you know, 10,000 lines of code. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, and it's that's not writing code. That's not being a yeah, it's not being yeah. a good developer. That's being yeah. being good about thinking through things. And I think if I was a Salesforce developer starting today, the first thing I would do is is get really comfortable with the configuration tool. See how far you can push them yeah. in the right way. Right. And then when it comes to Apex, is is to sit and start writing it for those use cases and think about how you structure it, but. One of the biggest mistakes I think I see developers make, especially at the start of their career, is, is almost too much of a focus on writing rather than reading. Yeah, uh, but not only just writing code um, or just on, you know, on coding in general, but I spent a lot of time, I, again, I was very lucky to have a really large code base in financial force to sit there and read through. Um, mm -hmm. And to understand, you yeah, know, they... They're all super smart you know, people that have written this stuff. There's a lot of patterns in there. You know, I went away and got myself a couple of books on enterprise patterns that were implemented so I could understand the patterns and understand how they're implemented and understand what they're doing. I read more code and wrote more tests in my first six months there than I actually wrote any lines of software that anyone would ever use. But it helped me to understand what was really going on under the hood, how the patterns working together and how to build these things out. And... <laughs> I think that's that's often misunderstood. Is you know you great um, if you, if you were to, if you wanted to become a really good artist, for example, you wouldn't just sit and draw all day. You'd also spend some time looking at art. If you wanted mm -hmm. to be a good musician, you wouldn't just sit practicing, you know, playing all day. You'd listen to different types listen. of music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. And so I think I think if I was a if I'm starting out as a brand new developer, you know, Trailhead's great. The Salesforce course is great. There's hundreds of courses out there are new to me and everywhere else. There's all different training options for you. There's loads of stuff out there that will teach you how to start writing. But sometimes the best thing to do is to go and go and have a look on GitHub. Um, you know, I, I still use to this day Kevin O'Hara's trigger pattern. It is the best one out there. Go and read through that. Understand why that is like that. Understand how that works. It's got Lots of, it's got inheritance in it, it's got overloading in it, it's got patterns in it, it's got all the stuff you need. Mm -hmm. It's scalable, it's, you know, it has bypass mechanisms in there, it's got everything. And it's like five files. You mm -hmm. can spend some time thinking about that and how that works and then go away and think, okay, now try rewriting it. Don't look at it, go away and try and write something similar to it. Um, 
you know, and if you do that, I think that will really help you get on there. I mean, you know, I, I don't need to tell people, you know, where to go and look for resources. There's a plethora of them. But what I really would encourage people, especially at the start to do is find someone who you want to, you know, someone in your company. Um, if you're a, if you're in a consulting company or in, in, a, in an ISV or whatever, find someone who does really interesting and good work and just say to them, is there anything interesting you've worked on that I could have a look at? And then go away and read it and then come back to them and say, I, I was just looking at this, you know, can I just explain to you what I think this does and why I think you've done it or how I think we might want to change it. And you know, don't, don't be, uh, go in there being humble. Don't go back and say, Hey, I think your code's rubbish. I could write it better. But you know, if you go back and say, have, did, why did you not do this? Could we have done this? You know, any, and if you do it in the right way, like that senior developer or architect or whatever will be really willing to have that chat with you and you can learn a ton more. And that's, that's going to like elevate you so much more rapidly than just, because if you, if you're writing bad code, um, and you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Writing a hundred thousand lines of it still doesn't make it any good. Yeah. Okay, you know, okay, I, okay. I can't, I can't play a musical instrument. And I cannot sing. Me singing for a hundred thousand hours is going to make me hoarse. Not going to make me any better at singing because I can't sing. I need okay. to go away and learn about singing. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. So a developer must essentially be an admin first and then a developer to be able to kind of uh, delve into uh, into the insights of what is most configurable items and what is the minimal level of coding that they should be going and for, right? And listening, yeah, I... reading through their stuff and then coming back and then rewriting the stuff to make it more optimized, basically, right? Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think you have to be an admin first, but I think you have to be aware of the admin tools. I think um, <laughs> I think I think that the I, I I'm I'm uh, there's a there's a very uh, often misquoted quote that I'm going to do the same here with, where apparently Bill Gates once said, you know, hire lazy people because they'll find the quickest way of doing something. Um, and I, I it's it's one of those quotes that isn't a real one, so yeah, don't go using it, but. In general, it's that, you know, I, I don't want to write 100,000 lines of code. I want to write 10. So what I want to do is I want to sit there and think, what is Salesforce doing out of the box for me? How can I utilize all these things? And then I'll write the 10 lines of code that makes it all work together. It'll be quicker. It'll be easier to maintain. And I can go and work on something interesting because, you know, sitting and writing, like the power of things like flow and and. <coughs> you know, uh, form, yeah, flow, formula fields, um, you know, name credentials, and you know, just the, the number of things that Salesforce gives you. Yeah. All of those cool things are there to help make your life easier. Yeah. Use them, and then and then you can get to work on something interesting. Like you'll get to work on an interesting integration, or you know, a high volume use case or something, rather than it being like, please, could you go and make another form that allows you to enter another five fields. Like, you know, that's that's a sole problem. No one wants to write a form. Definitely. And uh, I think the other interesting aspect is about the LWC these days, right? Because hmm. that's the most commonly used uh, UI element for everyone these days. So how can you kind of skill up on that uh, in terms of uh, making it, again, a best optimal solution, a UI which kind of fits all the bills and is able to efficiently perform the functionality that we are looking for? Yeah, so I think one of the... one of the, the I'm a huge fan of Lightning Web Components because um, I, I think it's a really good... Uh, a, it's a really good uh, framework in general. I also think it's a really good initiative by Salesforce to turn around and, you know, um, kind of get rid of Aura or just say, mm -hmm. look, don't use that. Um, I, uh, there was, uh, so the, one of the, one of the guys, or two of the guys that originally worked on Aura were a guy called Doug Chesman and a guy called Skip Souls, who both work at, uh, I think Doug may have left now, but uh, mm -hmm. Doug was also the guy that wrote Visual Force or had a large hand in writing Visual Force. And he came up with, uh, worked a lot on Aura. And I remember them coming to a developer group I was running just as Aura was announced and talking about it. And yeah, I had a really great chat with them afterwards. And it was, they were so knowledgeable and willing to share it. And they were like components of the future. Everyone should go there, build things. Um, and then web components became far more standardized and the industry kind of stood up really largely thanks to Facebook kind of pushing the shadow DOM in React everywhere. 
And I think it was really, really good of Salesforce to just turn around and say, actually, there's a better technical solution out there now. Use that better technical solution. Ours will still be there, but use that and we'll work towards that. And again, it allows you to get a lot of things done quicker. Um, and because it's so standards-based, I think if you're a developer looking at Salesforce now, it changes your view of it because you're writing HTML and JavaScript. That's the same, whichever, you know, you could be a React developer, a Svelte developer, or whatever developer, Good. JavaScript is, is there. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think I think it's a really exciting thing for developers to know that they can come on board with and learn about and use. Um, in terms of getting good at it, it's almost easier in some ways because it's visual. Um, I think you know, <clears throat> I think you can almost as a one of the nice things about it is that you could sit there and you could take any any website you want and try rebuilding it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's you know they're all all open. If you if you're a particular person, say you really like uh, using uh, Netflix, say Netflix is your favorite thing you spend all your hours on. Well, see how much see what you could do to rebuild a Netflix style system in Salesforce on an experience cloud, you know, app or um, or site. Or if you were a big user of Uber or mm -hmm. Shopify or whatever it might be, you know, if you yeah. just wanted to build a do app, whatever it might be, try doing it and it's visual and you'll be able to see it and and you'll kind of skill up a lot, you'll skill up really quickly there. Um, I think that the hardest things about LWC though is, is thinking in a component-based way and also thinking in a, with a UX hat on to combine them together. So yeah. it's a, yeah, it's it's quite, um, I'm working on something at the moment with a, with a customer, um, as part of my consulting sort of uh, side of the world. And we're rebuilding this page. And what I'm trying to do is they, they're kind of giving me this wonderful design. And my job is sitting there and pairing it back to the essentials to say, okay, what you really want is you don't want all of these things. What you actually want is a button and some text. You want the ability to do these 10 things and provide bits for them. And whilst it took me, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with them where they were like, yeah, how's it coming? And I and I show, I showed them like four components I built after you know a couple of hours, and they're like, um, you know, they couldn't really see it because they were like, it's it's you you've got two yeah. bits of text and a button like and a picture like, this isn't very exciting, Paul. What are we paying you for? And then I was like, well, give me another hour, and I can recompose. And it was because I was then able to go, okay, well, look, you want them this way, and then you want them this way, and then you want them this way, and then you, you know. And because really all they're doing is the same 10 things again and again and again with the same five or six components, you can spend the time up front breaking them down, your productivity goes through the roof. I mean, yeah, I, I sat there this morning um, and in I built out the first third of their page, you know, getting these components ready. And it took me about half a day in the other half, you know, in, in a couple of hours this morning, I built out the other two thirds of that page. Just because I was like, okay, great. Now I'm just changing these around and changing color, and it's yeah, really, and that's but that's the power of something like a component model. Um, uh, and yeah, if you're looking to learn, then you know, go away, learn some JavaScript, and and yeah, you know, it's much easier and more visual for you. Right. So it's absolutely like industrialized, uh, industry standardized, basically yeah. across the technologies, and it's very easy to grab now. Uh, rather than earlier, right, where it was yeah. a light language, but it was not absolutely the same language on yeah. HTML and JS. Absolutely right. So uh, one uh, question that always comes to my mind, uh, Paul, is that uh, since the time ChatGPT has come in, actually, right, so mm -hmm. it has kind of... Uh, disrupted a lot of things around and uh, people have started running behind that so basically when we talk about the gen ai tools right in general not just yeah. uh, gpt but uh, any gen ai tool so how does how do you think that uh, the coders would uh, have their life in the coming times so what will be the what will be the line of what is your line of thoughts around uh, the future now with the ai yeah i mean um I am old enough to remember that there was never going to be a need for a web developer again because of Microsoft front page. Um, so, you know, like I'd, if anyone who's anyone who's listening to this or watching this and is worried that they're going to lose their job, um, I don't think you need to worry. Like, it's, you know, it, it's not I, I can't see that happening because I think I think the the key word you use there is generative mm -hmm. and. 
you know, chat GPT and you know, uh, Gemini and all these other systems, they're really, really clever. Don't, don't get me wrong. They're absolutely unbelievable. And I love working with them day in, day out. Yeah. What they are is they're generative, which means that they're based upon what they've seen before. And that's, that's really, that's really interesting because it means that, you know, if I, if you and I were sat here at Manica and um, I said to you, what's that? You'll go, well, that's a cup, Paul. And I could show that to Chad GPT and it'll go, that's a cup. Um, but if I had a cup that was like in the shape of, um, I've got what, you know, I, say you had one that was like in the shape of a cow where instead of a handle, it had a cow's head, right? So I held that up, you know, Chad GPT might look at that and go, I think it's a cow. I think it's a cup. I'm not really sure. You know what it is. You know, it's a cup still. And you know, it, the, the generative AI is really good at taking information they've seen hundreds of thousands of millions of times before and creating new things based upon that. So if you say, um, I was using an image generation tool the other day. <laughs> if you say to it, please create me a, uh, a, you know, a scene using, um, using these parameters, it's really good. Mm -hmm. But it couldn't, it, you couldn't say to it, draw me a picture that's never been seen before or draw me you know, it can't it's not creative it's generative and so for a coder that's a really key difference because it's all well and good that saying it can write you the code um but how, how do you tell it what to write and like you know i mean we were having a conversation just before we came on air about uh, you've got an app around um salesforce estimation right on the app exchange yeah, yeah. and the hardest part of any development work i think is if you, so say you're my customer, right? And you're asking me to build something. The hardest part is not me sitting down and writing it. Technology is easy. Programming is dead easy. The hardest part is you and I sitting down together and me getting an actual understanding of what it is you want. Mm -hmm. It's me sitting there and going, okay, so when it does this, Manica, what do you want it to do? And you, and you go, oh, it should do this. And, then you, and you'll have a vision in your head and I'll have a vision in my head. And all we're trying to do is get that vision closer and closer together. Okay. So until the world can produce perfect requirements that have no ambiguity, yeah. coders are safe for a start. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I don't think, you know, as a, there's a, I remember when chat GPT launched, I was, uh, I was still doing uh, more consulting than I was chatting to a, a developer. I was like, yeah, yeah. How, how many times as a consultant do you have the problem where the requirements aren't clear enough? Yeah, all the time. So, yeah, it's, I don't think you've got to worry there, but I think <clears throat> I think as a developer, what you've got to do is look at the ways it's going to be able to help you going forward, and what you know what you're what you're going to be able to do to help it to utilize it to make you more productive, perhaps, rather than worrying about if it's going to replace you. If you know, if it could replace you, you know, a billion dollar company like Amazon or Microsoft would have already replaced well, all their yeah. developers. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. if so, Microsoft haven't sat there and got rid of their developers yet, despite the fact they own most of OpenAI, you don't need to worry. True, true, true. So I think the essence would be uh, to be creative and use generative to be productive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the hardest thing in, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier on about learning to program. Correct. The hardest thing um, when, you yeah, know, the hardest thing in programming, the hardest thing when I was writing my books, the hardest thing with anything is when you start off and you have a blank screen. Right. And you've got to think, right, I I need to start, right? And it's it's that moment of starting is the start of the creative process. And if you if you sat there with Chat GPT open and said, Could you build me a to-do app? It will go okay and it will knock together a very loose to-do app, but it's not going to be able to really help you do the kind of yeah, it's not going to do the things that you're doing where you're going, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to start this? What am I trying to do? And, you know, all that thinking, that that hard creative work of what am I going to do? There's that old joke, isn't there? There's two hard things. Uh, or one of the hardest things in their programming is naming variables. Yeah, that's that's the hard thing. You know, how many times have yeah. you sat there and and about what you should call a variable? You know, it's creativity. That's the hard part. Correct, correct, correct. So basically using to your advantage is the key there and uh, using it in a manner that it helps you uh, build out the stuff quicker and uh, better rather yeah. than yeah yeah because i mean i use so i'm a, a github copilot user uh -huh. and github copilot is i think one of the things that um 
I have a love-hate relationship with. There'll be moments where I'm programming away and I just go, oh, this thing is the cleverest thing ever. Like it's amazing and it's kind of, you know, tabbing and it's also completing my code for me. And then, then it just goes off at its own thing because it's like, well, I think you should do this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Stop, stop that. No. And yeah, it, it, it will name things differently. It will suggest names and infer names, which aren't, aren't actually what I've got in there, especially in an existing system. And so I know they'll get better at it, but I think, you know, as a developer, the way I use GitHub, uh, Copilot and ChatGPT is I sit down and I say, great, number one, as I'm going through, suggest things for me and I can ignore you or I can use you to tab. And it's it's a bit like um, there's a there's a tool in Visual Studio um, called IntelliSense, which you kind of, you get a little bit of in Visual Studio code, but it's not very good. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Um, and there was a tool for .NET when I was working on .NET called ReSharper, and it was like coding on you know steroids because you mm-hmm. press tab, and it would just auto complete things because it knew in .NET everything has ten interfaces and is very rigid, and you know you have all these things going on um, until you actually got to anything you were doing. And so it's a bit like that. It's it's one of those things. It's great to kind of sit there and give you an assistance and say like, oh, I think you should be doing this and doing that, and to maybe put together some boilerplate code. But when it comes to actually writing something interesting or intelligent, again, it's not going to help you. So I use it to help me out templating. I use it to help me out auto-filling things because there's a bunch of code you'll have where it's kind of, you know, I was doing a, a lightning web component the other day where I had button one label, button two uh, label, button one color, button two mm-hmm. color. I just did all the button one ones and then went down and started typing button two and it gave me all the rest. It just saved me 30 seconds of typing. It's you know, so there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> it's really helpful with chat GPT is great for asking questions um, to get answers rather than searching help documentation. Um, again, you'll need to have a, my advice would be for, for new uh, programmers, have a good reference guide around you. So either the Apex reference um, or something like that, because it will get it wrong. It's, it's using its data. Um, the internet is not always correct, and chat GPT is only based upon the internet. So, you know, you have to have a bit of a spidey sense about you to kind of, as you're reading something, go, that doesn't sound right. But if you use it like that, it'll really help rapidly, you know, kind of prototype and upskill you. You know, Einstein GPT is um, really good for the same sort of thing. Um, I just use Copilot because I do programming in other languages as well. But if you use them like that as an assistant or really a, I don't, know if, I don't know if you've ever done pair programming, but like, um, yeah. yeah, pair programming is fantastic. And it's, it's like having a pair programmer, um, yeah. not a very smart pair programmer, but someone that's just going to sit there and go like, we're going to do this next. You go, yes. If you imagine having, if you imagine having a, uh, a very, very clever, but also kind of just still only like 10 year olds sat next to you, that's what it's like. It's, you know, it's kind of able to sit there and go, is this what we're writing next? You go, yes, it is. Is this what you want to do? And you go, yes, it is. And then it will go and do something. You go, no, 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 no. This is why I'm here to still be in charge. Right, 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 right. No, I think those are absolutely key tips that people can kind of follow uh, using uh, the tools which are available nowadays to help you, to support you, do a best level of programming there, right? And using uh, uh, GPT probably as a pair programmer for you to correct the things that you're doing to make it streamlined uh, to the thought that you're trying to implement, right? So I think that, that that's a very key thing that uh, Paul has brought in up here, right? So it's, it's amazing. Um, I think uh, there were some things that which I wanted to ask you about, like uh, what are the areas of expertise that these developers can, can kind of prioritize for the, and then prepare themselves for the upcoming times, right? Uh, because there are... Uh, See, the Salesforce, uh, I think Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, these things have kind of become uh, generic skills nowadays. But mm-hmm. so does our programmers' uh, needs never go, irrespective of any industry areas or anything that we are working on, right? So what are the next-gen steps which they can kind of take it on? So I think if, um, I think the, the most important thing to remember about Salesforce is that it's, uh, so, so I'll answer this in two parts. So for, for Salesforce programming, I think the key thing to remember is that you're, you're completely right. Like sales cloud, service cloud, you know, all of these, uh, sales service, 
in particular, less so perhaps with the others, um, are a bit more commoditized. However, one of the biggest things that I think we're seeing and that I know I've noticed is is more people doing more on Salesforce. So um, when I was when I was first starting out, um, the release notes were under a hundred pages. Okay, it was really easy, hundred under hundred pages, and we all know the release notes. You know, you got about ten pages of you know stuff in the back, and you know you got four pages of safe harbor statement, and you know you got a pretty picture on the front. So there was a lot of gump in there, um, but I could read through them all. Um, the last release notes were what, like four thousand pages, something like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, reading the release notes is a full time job in itself. Um, right. There are there are great works of literary fiction that are not as long as <laughs> there's yeah I think the Salesforce release notes are now getting to like I mean I I'm pretty sure I've had an encyclopedia as a kid that wasn't that long okay so you you have the choice of reading all of Wikipedia or reading one set of release notes it's bad um, but <laughs> so <clears throat> so with that because Salesforce grows and because it's building all these new things there's more going on on the platform which means that for you as a developer, you've got to think more at scale. And, you know, when I remember my, uh, <coughs> one, of the, one of the things I had to, I used to look after at Financial Force and work on was their, uh, their SOAP API. So it was back before you could do REST APIs on Salesforce, back before you could publish your own. I used to uh, work on their SOAP API and test that and came up with a really, you know, kind of robust test suite around it and things like that. Um, and integrations weren't a very big thing. But nowadays, every company has five or six mm. cloud systems they're using with different integrations in there. And not all of them have an out-of-the-box tool. You know, some of them, you know, there's there's always, so if you are looking to, so you're looking to send a text message, right? You have two options, you have three options. Number one, you could go and install an app like mine. Um, and as a developer, you can integrate with it and use the APIs and it's great. That's really quick and easy to do. And uh, number two is you could go away and build something completely custom that calls an API like Twilio or something like that. And number three is you just decide you don't want to do it or you do it manually, kind of someone sat there texting out, which is always the worst idea. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in there, there's got, you know, somewhere in there for the first two, there's an integration that needs writing and using. And what I think as a developer, I would really try and get my head around now is <laughs> is how do I go about structuring my code to scale, structuring my code to be reusable, and enabling others to, to work together on the platform? So um, I did a talk uh, probably a couple of months ago now, um, as time keeps on flying by, but with um, uh, the Apex Hours team on uh, internal APIs. Mm -hmm. And the big kind of things that I've noticed and have worked with a few big organizations on is helping them build out a robust set of internal APIs so that they can coordinate their Salesforce system and their internal systems better. And so a really good example is, um, say you are using Sales Cloud, uh, Service Cloud, and a financial system. Say you're using, uh, so what we're kind of called Eden Accounting, you do an accounting system here in the UK that is on Salesforce. You, <coughs> uh, you close an opportunity, right? On that opportunity close, you want to um, create and send out the invoice to the customer. You mm -hmm. want to create them a new case, which is their onboarding case, because you're going to have a, someone ring up to talk to them about you know, how they're going to get their service started or whatever. And you also want to create a login for an experience for them. Mm -hmm. Now, all three of those things are on platform. However, the big question is, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And... At the moment, a lot of people would write a trigger or a flow and they would go from top to bottom and they normally start out with, you know, use case number one would be, okay, well, we create the case. And they go away and they write their code or their flow, get it. And the next use case would come in and say, well, actually, we also need to do this. And they go, okay, block one and then block two. And then they do those things. And then they come along and you end up with this very long kind of set of code that's firing around everywhere. What you could do is think, okay, well, how do I make it so that that can be abstracted away? And so, you know, when an opportunity closes, that's an event. That's something you can create either a platform event on or capture one of the change uh, change event um, handlers on. And when that happens, you can separate that. 
You know, platform yeah. events are caught and handled on their own transaction thread. You can create your own triggers and do that. And then suddenly it's like, well, all that you need to do then is think, well, I'm going to publish that this thing has happened. And I'm going to, as, as the developer on the finance team, I'm going to handle that event because I care about it. And I'm going to do my thing. And as a developer on the service cloud team, I'm going to do my thing and so on and so forth. And having those contracts makes it nice and easy. And you've just made your system scale like much more rapidly. And so thinking about how you segregate your system and how you use it, as a developer in particular, think about how you, how you can take what you've written, make it more reusable <coughs> and generic, but also make it admin friendly. You know, yeah. I would have years ago, I would have, I would have I'd have paid it, paid my right leg to have invocable actions, to have the ability from, I mean, back then it would have been workflow rules, but to have the ability to have something that can, yeah, I can do something complex in code and then just return you the result. And, you know, that would have been a lifesaver in so many situations. If you're never just making a call out or or just formatting some data, you know, Flow's really, really good at retrieving one object and its data. But say you wanted to get some parents and children and then you need to, need to do something to map them together. Flow becomes very loop heavy and becomes a bit of a mess doing that. And it can be quite conceptually hard to do. Mm -hmm. So just send that out to Apex. Just say, hey, I've, I've got this record here and I want you to give me a list back of, you know, of this custom data type and do that work in Apex and send it back. And you can do all these things that can really give you kind of quality of life improvements across your entire right. environment you to reuse it. You know, currency yeah. conversion. Anything like that, you know, yeah. date time conversion, you know, all sorts of stuff you can do that makes it really easy for you to get some of that stuff. Your admins will love you. You'll be able to build much more things, uh, much more faster, um, and you just be able to work together much more easily. And so, I, and that would be where, if I was a developer now, thinking like, where do I focus my time and energy? Think about that. I mean, go and go away and learn. Like, go away and learn some of the new stuff, Velocity and Slack, and you know. Um, data weave and all of these other cool and exciting things that are coming out, learn yeah. them, but don't just learn them in isolation because you're not a Salesforce developer who's going to suddenly become just a velocity developer or just a, well, you don't want to be, I assume, just going to, yeah, you're not going to go, I was Salesforce, now I'm Slack or now I'm velocity or now I'm whatever. You want to be, you want to be the person that someone says, how do we get these things to work together? And you together. go, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And that's where your value is. It's bringing them together. Integration is going to be the, the biggest thing you can spend time learning about and working on. Okay. Um, so, right. So I think the latest niche skills is something, integrations is something, and learning to make your uh, code scalable, reusable, and readable is something that you should be focusing on, right? Exactly, yeah. And, you know, doing that exactly. third one in particular, thinking about scalability, reusability, will help you when you go back all the way to the start of this conversation about how do you become a better yeah. program, you know, yeah. just sit down and think about these things. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I know, I mean, I experience the same thing when, uh, uh, because we are into velocity implementations primarily, right? So therein, basically, uh, what I face difficulty is the same thing that uh, the developers, either they are like purely velocity focused, Omni Studio focused, or they are Salesforce focused. But they need to bridge the gap and uh, hold hands with Salesforce and kind of learn those languages, both both the languages, Apex, LWC, and Omni Studio at the same time, and handshake well and kind of come up with an optimal solutions and designs, right? So, that's... yeah, I, I was just say as well. I think it's a really interesting opportunity as a developer and you know, yeah, as an organization is to sit there and think about. Um, yeah, what what are the what are the things you're doing all the time? So when you when you've got a, a, an Omni Studio developer and a Salesforce developer and they're working together, what are they working together on? Like nine times out of ten, there's so right. much commonality in a bunch of things. Well, you know, build yourself an internal library, build yourself an internal tool around it, right. train both teams on how to use it, and then right. suddenly doubled the amount of work that you can do there because everyone on the Salesforce team and on the Omni Studio team knows how to use those things. Right. And you can start accelerating your development much more quickly and it kind of spreads that that knowledge and that love. Absolutely, absolutely. So Paul, I think we are heading towards the our, our time. Just that uh, I think I wanted to understand from you a little bit about your books as well, right? How 
Uh, so these two books, Mastering Apex Programming and uh, Learning Salesforce Development with Apex, right? So uh, if you can kind of give a brief about the, these books and how they can help uh, the community to kind of, uh, again, leverage the books and uh, get going and get ahead of time, right? So Yeah, sure. So um, so I they're they're both apex focused books as you as you can gather from the titles um so yeah. learning learning salesforce to learn with apex uh, was the first book i wrote and i had been doing some salesforce training so delivering on behalf of salesforce as an official instructor and really enjoyed doing it um but learning code from a blank slate is quite hard and it's you know it's one of those things you're like okay well we're going to do this but you need to know that bit but that bit needs you to know this bit and this bit needs you to mm. know this and so you do all these little kind of mental circles you know where where there's kind of lots of forget you've seen this for now but we need to know it um, and so what I try to do <coughs> with learning Salesforce with Apex is is take it from the you know, from the real basics of how do I go about <coughs> excuse me learning apex bit by bit so starting off for those that have never seen any program what is a variable what is a method what is a function what do they mean what's a class you know and yeah i go through all of that stuff and build you up bit by bit and i try to make it cheap and uh, cheap as well so um i think you know the uk edition of that um is about 12 pound i think it's i think okay. it's 500 rupees last time i saw in india um okay. so which, which is i mean yeah it's not not a huge amount i think it's 500 rupees and forgive me because my currency conversion is terrible but <laughs> it was um it's not a lot of money you know what i mean i've tried to make it very approachable for people and it's written to be a reference guide as well so the idea is that you can read it end to end or you can go oh, i need to just look up that, that bit about how do how do i do that again and you can open that that section back up and and that section that. And, yeah, okay. yeah. And so that's really for either admins wanting to learn to code or people that are just moving on to Salesforce or learning to program on Salesforce. Yeah. And then after about two years, maybe maybe three, when you've got more comfortable with Apex, Mastering Apex is there to kind of help you go from either junior to intermediate or intermediate to advanced, kind of that broad spectrum where um, it's split into four different sections. The first, so the second edition has just come out. Um, so the first is really focused on like, common issues and making yourself a better developer so how do how do you just tighten tighten the work you're doing a little bit around things um we then go into uh, asynchronous apex options which again not a lot of developers get to see all the time nowadays yeah. um that we then have a section on uh, integrations so inbound and outbound rest um outbound soap calls using platform events um, building out APIs for flow as well and invoke actions. And then finally, we have a section on performance, which is kind of my personal area of interest. You know, I, I find it really nerdily boring. Going boring. Away, but I, yeah, I, I just, I love I love numbers. So I like going away. I like making a graph <laughs> and drawing another graph that shows it's lower. Um, so yeah, um, so it's more for, as I say, if you've been working with Salesforce for <clears throat> probably about two years plus um, as a developer, Mastering Apex for you is for you. If you're just starting out, it's uh, learning Salesforce development with Apex. Um, I don't know if we can put links in the chat or whatever for people on the, or we'll put links afterwards. Um, there is a sale on the Mastering Apex programming one at the moment until December the 21st. Uh -huh. You can get a discount on the uh, on Packet's website, um, which I can put a link to later on as well. Um, yeah, so they're, they're both kind of Apex focused books. Um, and you know, I'll be really honest. Um, I wrote them primarily to help me. Um, you know, they're, they're, I, I genuinely refer back to my own books because I forget stuff like everyone does. Um, you know, I, I, it's like my own little like hard copy of Chat GPT for Apex that I can just kind of jump back to and remember what I meant to be doing. Right. So, Paul, what I'll be doing is after this session, we'll be sharing uh, the video and the links on the blog, actually. So the links will be available to the general public for uh, reference later as well after our chat is over. So we'll put the links there so that everyone can make benefit out of it. So, guys, go ahead and search out. Uh, those are all available on the Amazon as well. So Mastering Apex programming and learning Salesforce development with Apex. And I will be definitely posting these links as well on my uh, blog uh, after the session. So uh, 
Yeah, so we are heading towards the closure now, Paul. So any closing notes and tips that you want to give for the community, to the community, because we are for the people and by the people, right? So. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I would say um, my biggest bit of advice and tip is is to just get involved with the community. I think uh-huh. it's um, the you know the only reason I, I said earlier on about like um, about how being when you know, being an MVP you kind of get more opportunities to do things. Like yeah. I, I would have never had the opportunity to have written a single book or have spoken to you here today or all of these things had I not got involved with people at the start and just been sharing my thoughts and ideas. I can tell you that a lot of people won't like them. A lot of people will disagree with you, but that's fine. You can, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to always be right, but just share what you're working on, share what you're thinking, share your ideas, engage with people about theirs. And, you know, Salesforce is really kind of very lucky to have such a good community. And so, yeah, try and get involved with it and you'll reap the benefits. True, true, true. Definitely. I think community is the uh, place, I think, uh, Salesforce is the technology where the community is the most, and we have the most active community and it's it's in real sense a community where people help out, reach out to each other and support each other, right? So guys, definitely that's the way to go ahead. Uh, all right, Paul, I think this was amazing discussion. I really enjoyed talking uh, to you today and I believe uh, people who are listening it out, who are watching us, We'll definitely make use of these tips and tricks around how you can improve your programming skills, how can how you can scale up, make use of uh the community level activities which keep on going and make use of uh, the reference guides and books which uh, Paul has uh, written, right? So definitely uh, it, it's an amazing uh, discussion, Paul. Thank you so much for giving your time today and uh, staying with us. And uh, thanks, people, for joining this session, listening out to our live streaming. And I'll catch you soon in the new year with a new uh, set of uh, Industry Connects and people to help you out and give it to the community. Paul. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great talking to you. Thank you and have a good day, Paul. And thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye now.